Welcome back to Principles of fMRI. In this module, we're going to talk about practical group analysis. We'll look at three things in a basic checklist. We'll examine the brain data, we'll examine predictors, and we'll check the regression results in a relatively straightforward and simple group analysis setting. And in terms of our checklist, here's some things we'll look at in terms of, in, in terms of looking at the brain data. We'll look at the brain orientation, a left-right flipping issue, and identical orientations across participants. We'll make sure that there's good brain coverage for all the subjects in the voxels we expect. We'll make sure that the alignment and scaling of image values are the same across subjects, which can help us diagnose a variety of problems. We'll look for outlier subjects, which might be a, sin a signal for bad data, and outliers in specific brain regions. We'll examine the predictors as well, and mainly here we're going to look for high leverage influential values among the predictors. And then we'll look at the regression results. And we'll examine this in three ways. One is we'll look for negative controls, we'll look for positive controls, and we'll look for resistance to outliers. The data set that we're going to be working with today as an example is a downloadable data set. It's a group analysis data set of 30 participants. And it's a task in which we instructed participants to view images like this really sad crying boy here and either just view them, that's a look negative condition, or they were asked to generate a positive frame, look on the bright side. And imagine that this boy, for example, is is crying because his mother just lost his cell phone and he, um, he'll get, be better in a few minutes. It's nothing really serious. Uh, so look on the bright side. And that's called reappraisal, uh, cognitive reframing. And people also looked at neutral images. So this is what happens to their negative emotion reports. Uh, negative emotion is low when looking at neutral images, high when looking at aversive or negative images, that's in red, and it gets better when they're reappraising, that's in blue. And the difference for a person between looking at the negative image and reappraising that image, or a similar set of images, um, is what we'll define as reappraisal success. So we're interested here in looking at the brain correlates of reappraisal success. And to do this, we'll look at brain activity during a contact, during the contrast, or related to the contrast, reappraise versus look negative. So are there areas in which increases in activity during reappraisal are predictive of how much, uh, how, how successful a person will be. So first we'll check orientation and coverage. The first issue is left-right flip issue. It's difficult to see which hemisphere is the left versus right if you just look at the images. And historically, many errors in flipping have occurred during processing. Uh, I've even heard people say we shouldn't even analyze the older literature from about five years past or, or prior for laterality effects, which is extreme, but it's a big issue. Uh, the view of the image can be either a radiological convention in which the left side of the brain appears on the right side of the image that you see, or a neurological convention in which the right side of the brain is on the right side of the displayed image. So we need to make sure that what we're getting is what we think we're getting. Different software platforms and image formats handle this flipping issue differently. There are a number of flags and changing standards over the years. So this is really a problem, especially when mixing and matching software. So here are some solutions. Uh, of course, the best solution is to make sure that you know exactly how your data were acquired and, and, and what the right orientation is. But we can also look at the structural images. And, uh, and there's some checks we can do there. And also, uh, it's a really good practice to tape a vitamin E capsule on the same side of a person's head every time. And then you can see that marker in the structural images just as a final check. So here's how we use a structural image to check the orientation. It turns out there's a natural brain asymmetry. I'll call it the left is larger rule in the occipital cortex. So as what you can see here is on the left side of the image, you can see a view of the brain looking from the bottom. So it looks like the left side of the brain is on the right side of the image here. Um, but you can see that the left side of the brain, the occipital lobe is actually larger and it produces this bend. So now on the right side, we'll look at an image in neurological orientation. This is a structural image. And for most people, almost everybody, we should be able to take your left hand and it should look like a, a sort of a, a cup. Your hand should kind of follow the curve of the uh, occipital lobe there, the, the interhemispheric the interhemispheric fissure <laughs> there. <laughs> okay. So this looks good. I'm actually getting neurological orientation here. Um, so the next part of checking orientation and brain coverage from all subjects is to look at the subjects 
uh, that I'm, the images that I'm subjecting to the group analysis, these contrast images for our reappraised minus look new, negative. Um, and I can look at the mean and standard deviation across those images. So this is what this looks like for this data set. I can see the mean reappraised minus look and the standard deviation of reappraised minus look. Uh, a few things to check. First of all, the orientation. In many standard viewers, there's a particular orientation. So I should, in these three panels here, this is SPM software, I should see coronal orientation, then sagittal next to it, and then axial at the bottom. And the sagittal should go anterior on the left to posterior on the right. The axial image on the bottom panel should go anterior on top to posterior on the bottom. So this is just a clue to make sure that your image is in standard space. Uh, in addition, we can look at the standard deviation image in particular to look for areas where there's very high standard deviation. That means a lot of variability across subjects. This means uh, often that the brains are not lining up. So here, if I see these bright bands around the edge of the brain, that's one clue that there's imperfect alignment across the subjects here. So we could maybe improve these results by checking and improving the normalization across subjects. Another basic thing is to ask, are you analyzing all the voxels that you think you're analyzing? Uh, so I can't tell you how many times people have done a group analysis, they don't get results. And if you look at the mask of which voxels were actually analyzed, people are shocked that a lot of the cortex is missing. This is because of how certain software packages have handled excluding voxels with impartial data or even just low image intensity values relative to the rest of the image. So here, what we expect is to see yellow in everywhere where we have data, valid data, for the full sample. Uh, and so here we see it looks pretty good. We're missing some coverage for a few subjects in the top slices of the brain, a little less than 30, but otherwise we're good to go. So now let's look for some possible uh, outliers in specific regions and some scaling issues. So this is a really compact image of the entire data set. This is a four-dimensional data set strung out into an image. And on the x-axis is voxels across the brain all strung out. And on the y-axis is images. These are subjects in this case from, from 1 to 30. And what we're looking for are subjects, first of all, that are really unusual. And what we see here is there's a two bands, subject 6 and subject 16, look like they're very bright across the image and very dark across the image, respectively. And if we look at the global values here, for, uh, across the, the cases, the subjects now on the x-axis, we can see that subject 6 and 16 are indeed quite different, uh, where subject 16 is the most different, that's circled in red. So that's an indication that there might be something funny going on with this subject, in particular 16, maybe both. Uh, other than that, we don't see any especially strange regions of the image, um, so nothing else actionable here. So these strong global shifts could be related to task-correlated head movement or physiology that's caused a whole shift in the image. Uh, likely, it's artifactual. And we live with a certain amount of artifact in every data set. Um, but it's still good to look for it and look for egregious problems. Another thing we can look at here is the covariance across the images. That's essentially the variances on the diagonal there, which is how much, um, how much variation there is across the image space, across space. And the off diagonals reflect how correlated the images are, essentially. Um, and this can help us to continue to diagnose issues of scaling and also possible non-independence across subjects. If you see sections of the data that are, are correlated, that have uh, a positive or negative off diagonal values. And here what we see is, uh, in particular, the two subjects that we flagged before, um, it's actually 6 and 16, uh, have higher variance across the image than all the other subjects. In addition, they have negative covariance. So these are potential influential values because they're pretty different from everybody else everywhere in the brain. That's going to have a greater pull on the regression line.